glad tidings church oh we can do a little bit better good morning glad tidings church that's awesome so i have a little challenge for you this morning right here right now in your seat i want you to look around you and if you see someone that you do not know their name i'm going to give you 20 seconds and i want you to introduce yourself and get their name now, if this is very uncomfortable for you, don't feel, <laughs> don't feel pressured. I don't want to create any trauma. But take 20 seconds and find out the person's name in front of you, behind you, or beside you. Go. OK, that's awesome. OK. We don't need you telling them about your weekend. Just the name. That's all I asked. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thank you. We do want to welcome you here this morning. Listen, if you are new, we are so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. And if this is your first time, we have a special gift for you. So at the end of this service, we simply ask that you would meet us outside in the lobby at the Blue Wall. Someone will be there. And uh, we just want to get to know your name and give you a gift. So all those new people, shout out to you. Thanks for being with us. OK, no, we can clap for them. We can clap for them. That's good. That's good. Oh, wait, are you clapping for me? Right, OK. Um, we had a faithful servant of the church, Violet Chapel, who passed away. And we just want to let you know that her funeral, actually her viewing will be Thursday from 7 to 9 at Passage Funeral Home in Shediac Bridge. And the funeral will be at Friday at one. So if you know her and you wanna support the family, uh, we would love that you would be there. Ladies, high tea. I hear this is getting lots of rave excitement. Uh, if you have yet to sign up, today is the last day to sign up for the ladies high tea. So that is happening next Saturday at 2 p.m., May 13th at 2 p.m. So last day to sign up for it. So there is a sign up sheet. Out on the lobby, a little tab table, I think B. Lynn will be out there, so please see her at the end of the service if you have yet to sign up. There's a yard sale coming on Saturday, June 17th, and starting on June 12th, we will be collecting your items. I'm not going to use the word junk because we really don't want to use your junk, but if it's something that you have that you know that somebody else can use, we would ask that you would bring that. That would be awesome. Uh, if you would like to give your tithes and your offering, we don't necessarily take time during the service to do that, but there are black boxes located at the back of the sanctuary and up in the balcony with envelopes to the side of them, so if you would like to do that, that's where you will do it. The Send is a global gathering that... <laughs> all my young adults, yes. The Send is a global gathering that exists to mobilize a generation into their missional calling to reach the world with the gospel and the SEND uh, partnered with Go, uh, Gather to Go will be having a pre-rally on Saturday, May the 20th at 7 p.m. at the Wesleyan Church. It'll be a night of worship, a night of unity, and a night of prayer. The tickets are free, but you will have to go to the Gather to Go website to get your tickets, so please do that if you would like to attend. And if you could please point your attention to the screen for a short announcement on video. generation waits for us to make a decision what will we give our lives for so many things compete to take the center in our lives some of them good some of them bad yet when we gain them something is still missing because fulfillment can only be found when we are fulfilled by Jesus and we can only find our purpose when we respond to the greatest need. The need Jesus saw and responded to, humanity. We don't have a marketing campaign, only a question. Almost half the world has no access to the gospel. A generation is in need. What's your response? Ready to respond to Jesus this morning? Let's stand to our feet. 
Can we lift our hands to the Lord today, just in surrender? Let's just lay everything down, come completely focused on him. Jesus, we are so grateful that we can come into this place together as a body and worship you week after week. God, I pray that we would never take that for granted. God, that we would just be so excited to get here and to come together and lift your name, God. We just wanna place you in your rightful place at the center of everything, Father. God, we shake off any pride or self-righteousness. God, any self-seeking glory, God. We just wanna give all glory, honor, and power to you. We praise you this morning, Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, sing that again. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing And every knee will bow, and every 
Father, that is our cry this morning. We come together before you, a holy God. We come from different backgrounds. We come with different issues. We come with different successes. But this morning, we lay them all at your feet. And we recognize that there is nothing that this world can offer us that has any value in comparison to knowing you. Better is one day in your courts than thousand elsewhere. And we are thankful this morning that we can come into your presence boldly because of the bloodshed of Jesus. We don't come with intimidation. We don't come slowly, but we can come boldly with confidence because of the sacrifice of Jesus. We are thankful that to be in your presence is the greatest place that we can be. We don't want this morning to just be another service where we go through the motions, but that it would be a, that it would be a morning where we understand that we are in the presence of the living and holy God and that we can live our lives in that same place. And that when your word is spoken, it goes forward not just to help us modify our behavior or to make us better people, but that it goes to cut through all of that to bring transformation into our lives. Your word is powerful. It never returns void. And so we ask God that you would do a work in our hearts so that we could glorify you and honor you that our lives would be a living sacrifice to you, holy and pleasing. That is our worship today. We give you honor, we give you glory. We are thankful for your word, and how you're going to speak to us this morning, and that you're already speaking. Hallelujah just encourage you as we go into the word this morning, just let your heart be open. You are going to be challenged. You are going to be encouraged. You are going to be blessed. You can go ahead and grab a seat. We have a special guest speaker this morning, and he, uh, before I reveal who it is, he, he said that he was nervous about speaking. It's been a while since he's preached, but I'll tell you that you would not know it when you hear this word that he has to share because it comes from the heart of God. We are very privileged and excited to have Pastor Terry McCabe preaching this morning. <laughs> Pastor Paul is still on vacation for a couple weeks, and uh, Terry and his lovely wife Rachel have been part of the GT family for quite some time. They are the mother and father of Winston and Leighton McCabe, a couple of our young adult leaders, and they've done a wonderful job raising these boys, and, uh, and we're just so blessed to, to have him share. And uh, brother, go for it, it's all you. Thanks, Spencer. Good morning, church. Wow, what a joy it is to be with you here this morning. What a privilege it is to open the word and look into it together. Just before I get started, I just want to thank you for just welcoming the McCabe's into Glad Tidings, being such a blessing to us. You've been so kind to uh, my son, Leighton, his wife, Jerrica, and my son, Winston, and um, 
his soon-to-be wife, Jessie. You've just been a blessing to us. You've just been a blessing to us. And uh, we just love our church so much. You know, a few months ago, we had to be away on a Sunday morning. There was just no way for us to avoid. We had a commitment somewhere else at, at another place. And um, I'll tell you, there was unhappiness in our home because we were going to be away from glad tidings. Do you feel the same way? I mean, are you not just blessed to come together with fellow believers, people who love Jesus and who are enthusiastic about worshiping him? Your worship is such a blessing to me, and I have to say even more so this morning in the second service, because I'll tell you, I remember as a dad exactly where I was the first time I saw Leighton and Winston raise their hands in worship. I remember where that happened the first time I saw it. But this morning, my little nine-month-old granddaughter was three rows ahead of us, and she was looking around at you folks as you worship. And guess what she did? Wow. Wow. What a blessing that was. People are watching you, church. People are watching you. You're setting an example. Well, I just want to thank Paul for, Pastor Paul, for inviting me to speak and anybody else who was involved in that decision. You know, when, when you're an old washed up preacher, you come to church every Sunday and you're just wondering to yourself, how long until they get so desperate <laughs> that they ask me to preach? And here we are. I'm finally here. This is just such a blessing to me to be able to open the word with you today and Normally, you know, I have to sneak onto the stage, and the last time I got to do that was when our little granddaughter that I just mentioned uh, was uh, dedicated. And some of you are probably here for that dedication service. There were a few different families up on the stage, and uh, we came up, and we, we just uh, blessed Leighton and Jerrica as they started out as new parents. And, you know, it's amazing because a baby dedication is kind of a, a really funny thing, isn't it? I mean... Like, we get up and we say things that, uh, you know, are just hard to commit to. I've been at some baby dedications where the pastor has said some really interesting things and, and had the congregation say some things that are just really hard to live up to. But I really appreciated Pastor Paul because he just said, Lord, this is what we want for this baby. We want uh, her to grow up in your love and in a family and in a home where you're honored and glorified. And so really it's us who are dedicating ourselves, right? Right? It's us who are being dedicated and we're saying we are going to live in such a way that we bring honor on Jesus so that it's an example to this child. Now you can't make another baby do anything. You can't make another human being do anything. Is that true, folks? Have you found that in line? You can't make another person do anything. The Old Testament makes that pretty clear with a couple of baby dedications. There's really most things that are dedicated in the Old Testament. It's, it's a thing. But there's a couple of people who were dedicated. In fact, they were dedicated even before they were born. One of them is Samson, and the other is Samuel. And I'm just going to say to you right now, they both serve as great examples. One's a great good example, and the other is a great terrible example. But if you had to decide which one you were going to put your money on, which one was going to be more successful in honoring the Lord and being a witness for the Lord and changing the world for the Lord, it's probably going to be Samson. I mean, you think about Samson. You think about what a, what, 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 what talent he had. You just think about the fact that, I mean, he had it all. He had a great physique. He had beautiful long hair. I can look out and see some people who wish they had some beautiful long hair. And he was supernaturally gifted. You ever look at somebody else's gifts and, and you just say, Lord, why didn't you give me that gift? Why didn't you make me like that? You know, I, I just love worship, and I've led worship in church for, for several decades, and on a good day, I'm an average singer, and sometimes I find myself being led in worship here, and I'm just thinking to myself, God, why didn't you make me like Kristen? Why didn't you make me so that I could sing like that? You know, Lord, I'd have used it for you. 
And I, the Lord doesn't speak to me really in any kind of a audible voice ever. But sometimes I sense what he's saying and kind of when my heart gets in that place when I'm saying, why didn't you make me like that, Lord? I kind of sense him saying, uh, let's talk about the things I did for you and the gifts I did give you. And uh, I usually try to change the subject at that point. <laughs> Samson was supernaturally gifted and yet his life was a train wreck. It was a disaster. It is a series of breakdowns. And Samuel, on the other hand, who we know almost nothing about, his physical appearance, very little, he just has this life of steadfast service, faithful commitment, unwavering service to God. Now, when we had that baby dedication for Brinley, my granddaughter, it got me to thinking about that word dedicated. And it got me to thinking, what are the things right now that I'm dedicated to? What are the things that I have dedicated my life to? And there's another place, another season of life where we use that word dedicated. And it's not at birth, it's actually at the other end of the lifespan. Some of you have already probably figured it out. It's in the obituaries. And that word comes up a lot in obituaries, dedicated. And somebody says, as they write the obituary for that person, what they were dedicated to. And there are some interesting things that people come up with to say. Now, as luck would have it, I have a habit of reading obituaries. Anybody else like to read obituaries just for entertainment? Okay, I'm surprised by that because you will read some very interesting things in obituaries. So every Saturday morning, I go through the New Brunswick obituaries for all of our major newspapers and I just scan them and, and I'll read a handful of them and I've come across some very interesting things that people say the deceased was dedicated to and I just wanna read a few of them to you right now. And these are real obituaries from real New Brunswickers and some of whom you may actually know, so I've changed the names, but let me just, <laughs> Let me just read a few of them to you. Before I do, just take a guess. If it's a guy, what's the number one thing most guys are said to have been dedicated to? Ah, <laughs> that's a good guess. That's not it. Their work. Yeah, their work. If it's a female, their family. Yeah, and sports, I would say for guys, is the second. I'll tell you, there are a lot of dedicated Leafs fans, according to the obituaries. <laughs> There are a few who will admit to being dedicated Canadians fans. But here are some examples from the obituaries that I want to read to you. George was a dedicated snowmobile enthusiast. Paul was dedicated to the future prosperity of New Brunswick. Wow, that's something to dedicate yourself to, isn't it? Mary was a dedicated knitter. He was a dedicated volunteer dog walker with the SPCA. Joan was, I can't believe somebody wrote this one. Joan was dedicated to her cats. Now ladies, how would you like to be immortalized by being remembered as a cat lady? Marcy was a dedicated bingo player. After he retired, he dedicated his days to his passion for golf. Barry was a dedicated arm wrestler. And here's, here's maybe my favorite. I, I don't know if it's my favorite or my least favorite. Sarah was, no, Sarah dedicated her days to thinking of and worrying about her family. Now friends, this morning, as we look into the word together, I want you to take a minute to evaluate your life right now. And I want you to decide in these next few moments we share together, what is it right now that you are dedicating your life to? What would you say, oh, 
What would the person beside you, because they're the one who's probably gonna write it, folks. What would they say you're dedicating your life to right now? You can dedicate your life to anything, but you can't dedicate it to everything. Some things are exclusive, and God's word tells us that, doesn't it? God says, you cannot love me and love money. You can't serve me and serve money. You can't love me and love the world. There are some things that you're going to dedicate your life to, and it's going to exclude other things. Now, it's no secret this morning what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you things that you already know. I'm going to tell you the only thing worth dedicating your life to is Jesus. Amen? Amen. The only thing worth dedicating your life to is Jesus. And we, we fuss and we worry and we go through stressful lives and we get things messed up because we have our dedication in the wrong place. And the amazing thing is that when we get that top tier right, when we put Jesus on the throne of our lives, when we dedicate our lives to him, everything else seems to fall into place more properly, doesn't it? I'm not gonna tell you anything you don't already know, but I can tell you this, there have been times in my life where I have recognized that I've gotten off track and that I needed to be put back on track. And usually it was by, by somebody who said something that I already knew. I, I knew where I should have been. But there have been some defining moments where I just made a, a, a navigation adjustment. And so I hope this morning, if you've gotten off track, that that'll be the case for you. The first thing I wanna tell you this morning is life is short. See, I told you I'm not gonna tell you anything you don't already know, right? You already know that life is short. What does that matter? What does it matter if your life is 10 years or 50 years or 100 years. What's the difference? What, matter does, what does it matter? Well, we all recognize that things that are in short supply have special value, don't they? There's only so much gold in the world. In fact, they tell us that if you collected all the gold on everybody's arms and in their ears and in their teeth and all that stuff, it would only be enough to fill a couple Olympic swimming pools. So we've decided in almost every culture that gold is of tremendous value. Well, let me share with you today, folks, your life is finite. It is going to come to an end. Your time will have an end. Your years will have a last one, and it is tremendously valuable. Your life is valuable. The only certainty in life is that it'll end. But sometimes, you know, we live like it never will. We get distracted by the things of this world. We get our focus off of where it should be and we focus on things that ultimately in the end don't even really matter. Sometimes we're helped to get our focus back on track. Sometimes we get a diagnosis or maybe a family member passes, a parent dies or some other tragedy happens. And it helps us get back on track. It helps us focus on what's really important in life. The Bible says in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, what does that mean? We, we recite that verse quite often. You all knew that verse before you came in here today. Teach me, O oh Lord, to number my days that I may gain a heart of wisdom. But we don't always put it all together. We don't always recognize what God is telling us. I think, friends, he's just simply telling us, do the math. Take a look at your life and how old you are right now and, and what the life expectancy is in the country where you live. I was shocked when I looked up life expectancy in Canada. Do you know how long humans live in our country right now? Take a guess. Yeah, like 80, 82. Men, it's a little shy of 80. And women, it's, I thought it was like just around 70, but no. It's right around 80. So if you're like me, we'll use me for an example. I'm 49. I knew you would laugh, but I really am. I am like a few months short of my 50th birthday. 
And it, it's actually a problem when you're my age and you look as old as I do. I have been getting the seniors discount since my 30s. I'm not kidding you, I really have. And it's a problem for me because I'm kind of a cheap guy, like I'm really frugal. And so I go into stores and now if they ask me flat out, if they say, do you qualify for the seniors discount? Uh, I'll just, I, like I'm not gonna lie about it. But, but sometimes the cashiers are kind of awkward about how they ask you, right? So they'll say, uh, do you get the seniors discount? Yeah, actually, I quite often do. <laughs> so uh, I won't lie about it, but you know, if you want to give me free money, I'll take it as a rule. So if the average human lifespan is 80 and I'm just shy of 50, what's that tell me? I'm already on the back nine, folks. I'm already on the back nine. And then you look at your own family and my dad, who loved the Lord and honored him, he got 57 years. So, you know, that kind of makes you think, well, maybe I don't have 30, right? And some of you, your parents lived and are still living maybe in their hundreds. If, if my dad went before 60, someone else has to live to 100 in order to make it even out to be around 80 years. But you need to do the math. That passage reminds us that acknowledging that our days will come to an end brings wisdom to life. How many of you want God's wisdom in your life? And God's word tells us that comes partially from recognizing that we are finite beings. Psalm 39 verse four to seven says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. Just take your hand out, hold it out in front of you. That's what God's word says. Your lifespan is like the width of your hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. We are merely moving shadows and all our busy rushing ends to nothing. Listen to this, folks. We heap up wealth not knowing who will spend it. We heap up wealth not knowing who will spend it. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My hope is in you. Friends, you and I are tempted to focus on things that are unimportant and ignore the things that are truly important because we're not paying attention to how quickly life passes. We focus on things that, that ultimately in the end, they don't matter. Like in our culture, what are some of the things that we focus on? I mean, one of them you've got to acknowledge is education. We worship education in our culture. We send our kids off to the right school and we feel like, oh, that's great. They've made it. So often not paying any attention to the fact that, that our universities are, are just cesspools of, of anti-Christian thinking, where Christ is dishonored, where his word is devalued, where any kind of moral uprightness is, is, is just disdained. And we somehow think that we are successful when we blindly just send our children into these places. And the irony is most of them were started to bring people closer to God. Most of them were started so that people could study the Bible. You think of some of the great schools in our country and in our, in our continent, like Harvard and Yale, started to study God's word and have drifted so far from that. Maybe you're focused on your retirement savings right now. Maybe that's your focus. You just realize, oh, I gotta get a million before I retire. Friends, you may not make it out of this room. Friends, God could call your number before I'm done preaching. And so at that point, your retirement savings don't matter. Jesus does. Now friends, what would it look like if you lived with the awareness that your life is so brief? What would change about how you live? 
What things would you place value on that you don't right now? What things would you abandon with no hesitancy that you currently value? What would you be dedicated to? Friends, whatever your answer is, be dedicated to it now. Do it now. We know that our actions would probably be different if we lived with that awareness because when we meet people who have received a terminal diagnosis, often they'll tell you that that happens. I've watched several documentaries on death and dying and how people respond to death and a, and a, and a terminal illness diagnosis. And right now you're probably thinking, wow, McCabe, you're a real party. <laughs> you read obituaries and you watch documentaries about death and dying. I haven't even told you about how much time my wife and I spend every summer touring graveyards. <laughs> Anybody else like to do that? Yeah, okay, okay, we've got some people here who know what I'm talking about. But I've watched several document documentaries about people who are diagnosed with a terminal illness. And so many of the people who are profiled say, I would never go back to life before my cancer diagnosis. What I have now, knowing that my life only has a few months left, I would never trade that for the health that I thought I had earlier. One man I remember said, I have learned how to love in a capacity that I never imagined. I have learned to recognize love in the world that I never saw before. Tim Keller, a famous Christian author, on a spiritual level, he said, he's, he's dying of cancer. He said, my wife and I would never want to go back to the kind of prayer life or spiritual life we had before cancer. Friends, if you really lived with the wisdom of knowing your life was going to end sooner than later, what would be different? What would be different? You can make money anytime, people. Seriously, if you live to be 90, can you still make money? You can day trade if you want to at 90. You can be grandma, making money on the market every day. How many years and which years do you have to raise your kids? You got one chance, one chance. And this world distracts us so often, so many of us from paying proper attention to guiding our children as they grow, and it is gone so quickly, and we have one chance to do it. Pay attention, pay attention, church. The second thing I wanna point out is that you exist to please God. That is why you exist. The scriptures tell us that. The scriptures remind us in Revelation 4, verse 11, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You have been created to bring pleasure to God. Isn't that an amazing, amazing thought, that you exist to please the Father? You hear about people who after high school or sometimes after university, they take a gap year to find themselves. You ever heard about that? You ever met somebody who did that? In reality, they're not looking for themselves. There's a saying, everywhere you go, there you are. When people take a gap year, they are looking for God. They are trying to answer life's great questions. Who am I? Why do I exist? What's gonna happen after I die? Those are the three great questions. And you, friends, can only find the answers to those questions by coming into contact with the God of creation through his son, Jesus. We've seen some transformed lives here at Glad Tidings, haven't we? Amen? Aren't you glad to be a part of a church where on an ongoing basis, you witness transformed lives? I mean, one of the most best examples that we've seen recently is, is Luke, right? I mean, don't you just love Luke? I mean, we have seen a transformation in his life because he has come to Jesus. And his life's been transformed. Now, do you think Luke is pleasing the Lord? 
I mean, think about how honored the Lord is by Luke's life now. Why do we have children? We hope that they will bring us joy and happiness and fulfillment. And God did the same when he created us. So I want you to ask yourself this morning, does my life bring pleasure to God? We exist, friends, to please him. And by loving what he loves and serving him, and of course by worshiping him, we bring him pleasure. Most of our love for God is expressed in our love for others. You remember that parable? That story Jesus told, there was a group of people listening to him and, and he said uh, that he was hungry and they fed him. He was thirsty and they gave him something to drink. He was unclothed and they clothed him and he was in prison and they visited him and they were all shaking their heads confused. When did we do this? We don't remember any of this. And he says, when you did this to the least of these, you did it for me. When we serve others, we please God. Jesus reminded us that he came not to be served, but to serve. So let me ask you this morning, do you love what God loves? Do you love his son, Jesus? Because he does. Do you love justice and peace and righteousness and goodness and kindness and faithfulness? Because those are the things that he loves. Those reveal his character. I don't know if you remember the story of Jesus and his disciples. He, he finds them one day arguing about who's the greatest among them. I mean, you just think, you just think about this, folks. They've given up their lives to follow the king of kings the Lord of all, the, the God of creation, the one who spoke the whole universe into existence, the one who has been granted all authority on heaven and on earth. And what's their discussion? Well, who's the most important among us? Instead of focusing on Jesus, they're focused on each other. And we can be like that sometimes. My next point is simply this, friends. We are called to holiness. We are called to holiness. Why should you dedicate your life to Jesus? Because he's called you to holiness. Jesus said something quite incredible in Matthew 5, 48. He said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. How you doing with that? That one's a bit of a struggle for me, I'm gonna be honest with you. Perfection isn't quite something I've attained yet. Perfection is something that I'm striving for with God's help, but it's not something that I seem to be able to attain on myself. It's a pretty high standard. Peter said it this way, as obedient children do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy as he is holy. Holiness and righteousness and purity. These are things, friends, that you and I are to strive for. And maybe you're here saying this morning, well, yeah, that's my problem. I, I want to be holy, but, but sin is right there with me. And, and if you only knew the things that I've done, if you only knew the things that I've done that God can't forgive, and there are lots of people on the face of the planet who think that. They think that they have done something that God can't forgive. You take a look through the scriptures, there's no whitewashing there. You see people who murdered who were forgiven. You see people who slept with other people's wives who were forgiven. I mean, there are some serious sins in scripture that God forgives. And if you think that you're here today and you've done something that God cannot forgive, you are mistaken. And we focus on holiness and we strive for it on our own. And, and let's just pretend holiness is somewhere over there under the exit sign. And I'm way over here. 
I mean, if I'm going by my own merit, I'm way over here. And I'm looking at holiness, and I want to be holy because I want to honor Jesus, and I want to bring glory to him, and I want people to look at my life and know that there's something different because I know Jesus. And so I'm striving on my own strength for holiness, but I'm never going to get there this side of heaven. I'm never going to get there on my own this side of heaven, folks. There is only one way to get there, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's only one way for us to achieve holiness, and that is through the sacrifice that was made for us through the blood of Jesus. He died for us so that we could achieve holiness in God's sight. So if you've come in here today with some bad record that you think God can't get past, forget about it, he can. But we still strive to be holy. We still strive to bring honor to God through a holy life. You need some tips for living holy? Uh, here's one. Stop being entertained by music and movies and video games that are created by people who have no desire to honor God, who seem to be bent on bringing shame and disrepute to God's people. I mean, friends, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I, I, I am terribly concerned when I see some of the things that God's people allow into their minds. It, it's not doing us any good to spend the week in the world consuming filth that the world produces. We need to be setting ourselves apart. We need to be doing what we can to live holy lives. And we need to be extremely careful about what we allow into our minds. And so little, if any, of what our world is producing for entertainment is something Christians could, should consume. I, I don't know about the house you grew up in. I grew up in a preacher's house. And we had a couple of channels on the TV when I was a kid. And if somebody used the Lord's name in vain, that TV went off. It didn't get turned back on the rest of the day as a rule. It might not get turned back on for a few days because in my house, we were going to honor the Lord. And if you think your television show is going to be aired in our living room and you have the audacity to use Jesus' name in vain, uh uh, ain't going to happen. We are different from the world, we are set apart from the world. Here's another tip don't miss church. Don't miss church. I've made it one of the principles of my life that wherever I am, I'm going to worship on Sunday morning or at least sometime in the week. And my kids were into sports, just like yours probably, and it was difficult at times. But I'll tell you, every weekend, we always found a group of believers to worship with. And and there were some awkward times. I remember one time we were leaving after an early Sunday morning game and we were going to church. Uh, This was out of town. It was up in Ormonto. And and people were saying, well, you got another game coming up. Where are you going? And I just said, well, if the service ends sometime, we'll be back. See you then. When God's people meet, be there. The Bible tells us not to neglect our meeting together as some people do, but to encourage one another, especially now as the day of his returning draws nigh. And the Bible also tells us it was Jesus' custom to be in church. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Friends, do you want to be like Jesus? Do the things that Jesus did. Don't miss church. When God's people meet, be there. Prayer meeting Tuesday night, that is such a wonderful time of encouragement here in this room. We lift each other up. When somebody has a hurt or a care or a diagnosis or a a burden, there are people who come around and lift that person up in prayer. It is such a blessing. When God's people do something, jump in, do it. 
How many of you remember the 40-day fast that Pastor Paul introduced back uh, at the start of January? I mean, Pastor Paul, he announced it like early in January. It started January 16th. And um, he just said that, the, that they were gonna be doing 40 days of fasting. And, and I, didn't really, I didn't really know you could pick what you wanted to fast from. He didn't explain it. And I just thought they were going 40 days without food. I thought, man, these Pentecostals are intense. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if I can get 40 days in, but I'll start with you anyway. And, and as long as I make it, I'm right there with you. But I would tell you, friends, that I jumped in on that with both feet, and it has been a blessing in my life. And I'm still going. I think we're around 100 days or so, so far. But what I committed to then, I'm still doing. Now, how many of you would say, I jumped in at that 40-day fast, and it was monumental in my life? Yeah, yeah. It's not wonderful to look around and see. We did that together. When God's people are doing something, or let's put it this way, when God is doing something among his people, get involved. Be involved in that. We read a few verses in 2 Corinthians 6 that, that just make it so clear how much God wants us to be separate from the world. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18 says it this way. Just, just let these words sink in. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are God's temple. We are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Listen to this phrase. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you and I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters. The word dedicate is pretty closely connected with the word consecrate, but they're a little bit different. When you consecrate something, you actually take it and you set it apart for holy use specifically and entirely for God's use. And the term consecrate actually means to fill the hand. And when we consecrate something, we're taking it and we're saying to God, we are putting this in your hand for you to use exclusively, entirely, and for your will and pleasure. I don't know if you've noticed what God is doing among young people in the church today. I don't know if you've recognized how there is a movement of God among young people in their teens and 20s and 30s. That's just incredible. And we are seeing people turn their lives entirely over to God. We had a group here earlier this year from a, a group called Contend. And these people are, are just giving their lives to Jesus in radical ways. And they're saying, I don't care about the things of the world. I'm not going to get focused on buying a house and, and buying fancy cars and having the nicest things. God, I want my life to be put in your hands and I will go anywhere. I will do anything. I will serve any way. I will honor you anywhere you put me. I am in your hands. Use me how you will. And they're doing incredible things. Have you noticed this? It's just amazing to see how God is using young people in our church and in our city and around North America, and some of these people are praying and fasting for an end to abortion. That some of them have taken vows that they are not going to eat meat or cut their hair again until abortion ends in their city. Wow, don't you want to be part of something like that? You know, I look at, at the young people and I say, God, why didn't you do that when I was that age? Why weren't you working among young people like that when I was your age? And again, I kind of sense the Lord saying, what's stopping you from being involved in that now? 
What's holding you back because you're 50? So again, I just changed the subject. Last week when Guy preached, remember when Guy preached last week and he talked about owning all those toys, the snowmobile and the fifth wheel and the big truck and his house was paid off. And Pastor Penny says to him, his father says to him, yeah, can you give it all up? Whew. I was kind of getting heated in here, isn't it, when he said that? And some of us were like, okay, I just got to get out of here 10 minutes from now. I need 10 more minutes before I really feel challenged. But listen, some of you, some of you were, your hearts were burning and you were saying, yes, God, that's me. Call me to some foreign land. Call me to some big work. God, do a work in me. My heart is burning to serve you and God bless you for that. God bless you for giving your life over to God like that. You can vow to consecrate your life to Jesus today. I'm just gonna call the worship team back up. And as they're coming, I just wanna remind you, Jesus dedicated his life to you. Jesus gave his life for you. And our desire is to be like him. Do you remember when he washed the disciples' feet? Do you remember when he knelt down in front of these these men and literally cleanse them. Cleanse, I mean, I come into worship so often, friends, and I, and I just think, God, how can, I, how can I even come in here unless you cleanse me? And how can I ever be clean unless you, Heavenly Father, cleanse me? And he's done that through the cross. He has done that through the cross. The only way for us to be clean It's through the blood of Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to partake of communion together. The Bible reminds us that for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's how dedicated Jesus was to you. He took on your sin. If for no other reason, that should motivate you to dedicate your life to him. We're going to take of communion. And and I just want you to understand before we do this, friends, this is an outrageous action. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're about to take on his body and his blood. It's an outrageous thing that we do together. Jesus spoke about it. He said some pretty disturbing things. John 6, 53, it says, Jesus said to them, Verily, truly, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Do you remember what happened as soon as he said this? A lot of people just left. People just walked away. They were intrigued by some of his teaching, but this was just too much. You know, the Jews kind of had a thing about eating flesh and drinking blood. And it wasn't until several years later or some time later that we fully came to understand what Jesus meant when he said that. It's not until Passover that we learned what he meant. When he took the bread and broke it and took the cup and passed it. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're dedicated to him, then I invite you to partake together with us as a body of believers. But just recognize the sacrifice that was made for you. 
the incredible sacrifice of Jesus' body and blood. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Friends, there's just one more thing I want to remind you of before we dismiss. One more reason that we need to dedicate our lives to Jesus. It's because he's coming back. Amen? Jesus is coming back for the church. Jesus is coming back to take us to that place that he's preparing for us. And I got to tell you, on that final day when Jesus comes back and he is separating the righteous from the unrighteous, the saved from the lost, the sheep from the goats. On that day, I don't want there to be any confusion in his mind as he scans the multitudes. I want him to see McCabe and say, I know which side you're on. Don't you want that? Have you thought about what that's gonna be like when Jesus comes back and takes us to be with him in the Father's presence for eternity? He's coming back, church. He's coming back. Let me just close with this picture. There's a school in the Netherlands, in the city of Radboud, and it's a pretty big school. It's a university. They've got 22,000 students. And they recognize that among the young people in this university, a lot of them were really struggling with the pressures of life and that there was a, a lot going on that people were focused on that was distressing them and even causing mental illness. And here's their solution. Here's what they did. You may have heard about it. They went out onto the campus and they dug a grave. They dug a six foot grave. They put steps down into it. They put a little mattress and a pillow down there and they invited the students when they were getting stressed out to go down and lie down in the grave so that they could focus on what is really important in life. How many of you would take them up on that? How many of you would like to, to try that? Friends, when you go down in the grave, the walls of the grave come up and your focus is narrowed to the heavens. How many of you would go down into that just for fun, just to give it a try? I mean, you know I would. I'm Mr. Obituary and Graveyard and all that, right? You know I'd be right in on all that. But friends, you have already done that. You have already gone down into the grave. Romans 6 says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Folks, you've been there. You have already done that. You've already decided that your life is going to be dedicated to serving Jesus. And most of you have already gone through the waters of baptism. Now, maybe there's somebody here who before you leave today, you recognize you need to dedicate your life to Jesus. You need to give him your life. And we're just going to stand and sing in a moment here. Why don't you stand now? And many of you... Most of you have already dedicated your lives to Jesus, but maybe something was said this morning that pricked your heart. Maybe there was something said that made you realize, I'm off track. I'm not living the way I should be living. 
I'm not focused on Jesus the way I should be. I'm not pursuing holiness the way God would want me to. I'm not honoring Jesus in my life at work. I'm not watching things on TV and on the internet that bring him honor and glory, and I'm only watching things that, that I shouldn't be watching, and I recognize that now, and this is gonna be a defining moment in my life. I'm going to change today. This is gonna be different. Friends, come forward as we sing our closing song. There are people on the ministry team who are gonna be here to pray with you, and they have been praying for you all week because they know that decisions need to be made. They know that lives need to be changed. They know that lives need to be turned to Jesus. So wherever you are today, let's resolve that we are going to be dedicated from this point forward to Jesus Christ. ministry team can come forward now as we worship. Do that. 
Doing here in this place, and if anyone wants to come forward for prayer, these altars are still. 